So I think there's quite a few things going on in the city today. Um, so there's a few researchers that said their regrets, um, but we will uh, have meetings if people have missed and you know somebody that really wanted to come, uh, send me an email and we can get that sorted out. Um, so today we're really lucky to have um, Dr. Ruth Banias here with us. She graduated from the University of British Columbia with a MD PhD in neuroscience and then did her residency at the University of Western Ontario. So kind of all of the really important pieces for imaging is really cool. Um, she's an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Western Ontario. She established and directed the Traumatic Stress Service and the Traumatic Stress Service Workplace Program. So these are services that specialize in the treatment and research of PTSD and related comorbid disorders. And she's currently the Harris Woodman Chair in Mind Body Medicine at the School of Medicine and Dentistry at Western. And we'll hear about her research today, but her focus is on neural correlates of PTSD using neuroimaging and treatment outcome research examining various pharmacological and psychotherapeutic methods. So please join me in welcoming Ruth to our seminar series. And Thanks, Katie. It's a pleasure to be here today. What I wanted to talk a little bit about today uh, is shift from a cortical-centric, amygdala-centric approach and move a little bit into the reptilian brain and how that may play a role in PTSD and share some early stage studies with you and really think about when we're confronted with stress, how important innate reflexive responses are. And I think uh, it's hard to image the brainstem and we're again still in the very early stages but I think in order to progress in the field of stress, we really need to think about uh, that lower reptilian brain. Now, to start out with, I'd like to thank all my collaborators about whom this work would not have been possible. Uh, today, I'm going to be presenting uh, the work from my graduate student and now postdoc, Andrew Nicholson, uh, Thomas Ross, who's now at the University of Geneva, Robin Bloom, as well as several others. And one of our collaborators is also with Kent Jetley, who's just walking to the room by the <laughs> So I'm going to talk about uh, the functions of the innate alarm system, which is this really subcortical system. That's where it starts, and then, of course, reaches to the limbic system and the cortex later. But that part of the brain that's really involved in innate reflexive responding. And with a focus on the periaproductive brain, and we're going to look at periaqueductive brain connectivity and post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as its dissociative subtype, and we'll talk about what that is. And we'll also look at some directional connectivity and how that may relate to the clinical findings. And uh, towards the end of the talk, we're briefly going to talk about uh, the amygdala alarm system in social cognition as well, and how that's affected in post-traumatic stress. And then we're going to finish the talk by looking at treatment implications, early stage studies. Can we actually use a form of treatment that affects these lower brain regions in order to facilitate healing of people with post-traumatic stress? All right, let's talk about when threat is near. And some studies that really influenced our group uh, are by Dean Mobs uh, in the late 2000s who I think really uh, designed an ingenious uh, uh, FMI imaging paradigm in healthy individuals where he showed healthy individuals a tarantula spider first at a distance and that spider then came closer and closer to the person while they were in the scanner. And what Dean Mobs found was that when the spider was far away, he got predominantly prefrontal structures activated. But when the threat became imminent and very close, he saw that that brain activation very much shifted to the reptilian brain, namely the periaproductive brain, among other structures. And so when we think about people with post-traumatic stress, for them, threat is always imminent. They always feel they're going to be attacked again or hurt again. So for them, threat is always imminent. And so we wanted to think about uh, you know, mobs this paradigm further, and we start to examine, especially the periaqueductal brain in post-traumatic stress. Here's just a quick uh, diagram of the alarm system. I just want to uh, point out a couple of things. 
this key structure called the superior curriculus, which is uh, very uh, interlinked with the periaqueductal grade. And the superior curriculus gets direct uh, input from the retina. It also gets direct sensory input. It has a little sensory homunculus within it. And it also gets auditory input, all at a subconscious level. So we can see, hear, and feel without the cortex, actually. And then, of course, there's connections from these lower brain stem structures into the cortex, where we then become conscious of, we, of what we see, feel, or hear. So how is this system important? And I always give this example. I was walking to a talk with one of my graduate students. And we were walking down the road. We were stopped at a four-way uh, stop sign. A truck was stopped. We crossed the road. And as we crossed the road, all of a sudden, the truck accelerated. And I just grabbed the arm of my graduate student and pulled him out of the way. I didn't see that truck accelerate with my cortex. It was completely a reflexive response. And so I would hypothesize that my superior curriculus picked up directly from the retina that visual cue about the truck accelerating. And then from bottom up, periaqueductal gray up, I initiated some uh, involuntary motor responses that pulled them out of the way. And so these are innate reflexive responses. And as you can see from that example, they're critical to stress survival, right? We don't have time to engage the cortex right away and think about, well, is this guy going to attack me, or is this a safe environment? We need something to be quick. And so I think this is what the innate alarm system is critical for. So as I said today, we're going to focus on the periaqueductal grade, which is a very small structure, as you can see on uh, the brain image there. And it's critical for autonomic regulation. And because of that function, I think it's also a key structure that really connects brain and body. And so I think the brain-gut connection is key here. The brain-heart connection is also key to the structure. It also plays a critical role in sleep and in pain. All of those things are also critical for uh, experiences of chronic stress. It's highly conserved. And it has specific areas that are involved in different uh, defensive responses as well. So uh, the dorsolateral periaqueductal gray helps us with active defensive responses. And the ventrolateral periaqueductal gray helps us with passive defensive responses. And we'll talk about that in some detail. It also plays a, an important role in all basic uh, emotional raw affective responses. So you know, raw affective anger, fear, panic, and joy all seem to be rooted in the period of the brain. That concept has done a lot of work on that. In fact, Punk suggested that primal emotions, so we're talking about raw affective states, not knowing what you feel, but raw affective states emerge from deep ancient brain structures, not <coughs> from the cerebral cortex, which is associated with thinking and planning. And actually, when we go back to Damasio's study years ago now in Nature Neuroscience, where he looked at a generation of different emotions, both positive and negative, what we find is that one common area of brain activation across negative and positive emotions is the periaqueductal brain. So giving some support to the fact that this is a structure that uh, facilitates affective responses. Of course, then we have higher structures as well that help us to reflect on what we think and that drive these raw affective states. This is a study done by Merker, who uh, talks about consciousness and raw affective responses uh, without a cortex. You see this child here. She was actually born anencephalic, so she didn't have a cortex. And Merker shows when the infant is placed into her arms, you can see those raw affective responses, which she postulates are driven by the periaqueductal So one thing I, I think is really relevant to PTSD is these active versus passive defensive responses. And so we have very distinct parts of the periaqueductal brain mediating these active versus passive defensive responses. 
And just so you can get an idea, if you're not uh, seeing patients, what is an active versus a passive defensive response, you can see the guy on the left, he's engaging in active defensive responses, right? Whereas the guy on the right, he's engaging in much more passive defensive responses. He's very emotionally attached, he's hypo-emotional, probably detached from his body, and he's passive, right? If he's, if he's threatened, he'll probably not engage with an active defensive response, but he'll be passive. Whereas the guy on the left is very different. And so very different parts of the periaqueductal gray are mediating these active versus passive defensive responses. So how do symptoms of post-traumatic stress relate to active defensive or passive defensive responses? And I think at the core of post-traumatic stress is that the memories are not remembered, but rather they're relived, right? So when people have post-traumatic stress, when they're recalling a traumatic memory and they, when they're having a flashback, for them it feels like they're back at the scene of the trauma. And this can be relived in the, term, in the form of active as well as passive defensive responses. For example, if uh, somebody is assaulted, you know, if there's a chance of escape, often they'll engage in fight and flight uh, activities. And so when they're reliving the assault, they may actually you know, get ready to engage in that active defensive response because they feel like they're back at the scene of the trauma. However, if the threat is inescapable, a passive defensive response is much more likely. And so often, you'll see people report that they freeze, they numb out, they feel in shock, and they detach emotionally. And so when they're reliving the trauma, often that's the response they have. So reliving the trauma can be related to having active or passive defensive responses. And recently we had a dissociative subtype added to the DSM, which really deals with more passive defensive responses, this hypo-emotionality, so detaching yourself from a chronic, inescapable stress, often associated with out-of-body experiences, so looking at yourself from above or feeling like everything's unreal because that really detaches you from the intensity of the emotional response. So when we think about stress response, how does all this make sense? This hyper-emotionality associated with active defensive responses versus this hypo-emotionality associated with passive defensive responses. And uh, this is, I think, where the Defense Cascade model that was originally proposed by Schauer and Albert, Kozlowska has written about it, our group has written about it as well, I think makes a lot of sense, and I think it's also very evolutionary relevant. And so when there's an organism that's faced with a predator in the distance, the first thing that organism does is to have a brief orienting response to figure out where the organism is in relationship to the predator. Then, of course, the most adaptive response is to flee, right? Is to get the hell out. And so what you need is a lot of sympathetic activation, right? You need uh, more adrenaline, cortisol in the activity, that which gets the blood moving to the muscles and to the heart so you can flee. If fleeing is not possible, what's the next most adaptive response? And that's to fight, right? And so now you're getting ready to fight. Again, you need sympathetic activation, a lot of blood to the heart and to the muscles, but you also need a bit of analgesia, right? Because fighting could result in some wounds. And this is where the endocannabinoid system comes in. That mediates analgesia in that active fight-flight response part of the stress response curve. What about if fleeing or fighting and uh, or fighting doesn't get you anywhere. So what's the most, the next most adaptive response? And that's really tonic mobility, right? So death fainting, in the hopes that the predator will lose interest. And now you have equal sympathetic and parasympathetic activation, right? It's when the rabbits freeze or when the mice freeze. And our patients freeze, right? They have this tonic mobility where their muscles tighten up, it can be part of the body, it can be the whole body, it can be gaze, it can be predominantly respiratory muscles. So breathing often becomes very shallow and people become hypoxic. 
And once you've reached target mobility, and the hope is that the predator will lose interest, and if the predator does lose interest, it's very quickly reversible back to fight and flight. But what happens if the predator doesn't lose interest, which would be the case in chronic abuse, chronic childhood trauma, in torture? What does the organism have left to do? And that's really to go into unresponsive mobility, so completely passive defensive responses. So now the body shuts down, heart rate goes down, blood pressure goes down, temperature goes down, uh, people become apneic, so they decrease uh, breathing, breathing is much more shallow, oxygen goes down. And when you're in a situation of chronic inescapable stress, you also need massive analgesia. Right? which is uh, in the form of mu opioids in this part of the stress response curve. What's also associated with chronic and stable stress is the release of dimorphins, which bind to kappa opioids receptors. And the dimorphins seem to mediate a lot of other body responses, so there's emotional attachment, but they also drive really chronic depression, chronic dysphoria. And we would hypothesize that chronic depression, you know, related to chronic inescapable stress, such as chronic childhood maltreatment, may be partially driven by these dynamics. So when we have these passive defensive responses, we also have other body responses that are associated with those. So how does that happen? And what has been postulated in the field and we're collecting some data on that now, is actually the thalamus that really inputs sensory information to the cortex. There's a functional cortical deaffrontation. And so the thalamus is not connected to the cortex. So sensory information can't be shipped to the cortex where it's integrated and where you really know what you're feeling in your body. So by definition, you're detached from body sensations and you have an out-of-body response which is a blessing when you're really uh, exposed to chronic inescapable stress. And so this is just the uh, stress response curve or the defense cascade in a nutshell, and it helps us to understand, I think, how active and passive defensive responses can help us survive a stable stress on the left, right? So fight and flight is really about stable stress, and passive defensive responses are of inescapable stress. And these are mediated by the dorsolateral and ventrolateral PAG, respectively. Here. May I ask you yeah. here? I mean, you have some neurotransmitters. When you think about uh, the coronary system in the brain, would that be linked with dissociated subtype? Yes, there's uh, a couple of studies, one by Mason in people who have blunted emotional responses, and one by Zappo, I think, and what they show it in people with dissociative responses, um, the cortisol response is also blunted. Yeah. So now something we were interested in is really looking at the functional connectivity of these different parts of the periodontal brain associated with active and passive defensive responses. responses. But before we look at the separate parts of the periapodontic brain, we just look at the periapodontic brain as a whole. And this was uh, work done by my postdoc, Jimmy Tong. And so we started looking at 41 controls as they were lying in the scanner, letting their mind wander. And if you're a healthy individual who hasn't healthy quotation marks, although we're pretty strict on who we include, and if you don't have a history of trauma and you're just lying in the scanner, you're probably not experiencing a lot of raw emotions that would be driven by uh, the periapodontal brain. You're probably not about to be engaged in a defensive response. Like you're not hypervigilant, waiting to see what happens. And so I think this is reflected by the periapodontal brain connectivity that we see in healthy individuals. There's not much going on. There's uh, connectivity within the periapodontal brain and some to the thalamus, but there's not much going on. Now, when we look at people with post traumatic stress, this is very different. Again, you don't need to be a neuroscientist to see 
you know, that their connectivity is very different at rest. And what they do is they connect, the periapidotal brain connects with different regions involved in emotional reactivity and defense responses, including insula, the amygdala, precentral gyrus, basal ganglia, and others. And uh, I think what this represents clinically really is that patients with post-traumatic stress are never at rest. They're always ready, you know, always on alert, always ready to defend themselves. And I think this is what uh, this picture shows. But our next objective was really to look at uh, these different dorsolateral, metrolateral, PAG subdivisions in people with post-traumatic stress and its associated subtype. So people with post-traumatic stress without the subtype exhibit predominant uh, active defensive responses, whereas people with a dissociative subtype exhibit a lot of passive defensive responses, although they can also have active responses, active defensive responses at times. So really the orange part of the curve represents the subtype, the passive defensive responses, although they often cycle quickly through the active defensive responses before they then shut whereas PTSD without the subtype, they predominantly exhibit uh, active defensive responses consistent with fight and flight. And so our hypothesis were that uh, PTSD and its subtype will demonstrate increased dorsal lateral PAG, which is involved in active defensive responses, with areas pertaining to sympathetic nervous system activity and active defensive uh, strategies. Whereas the subtype we uh, proposed would show greater ventral lateral periapidoptal brain involved in passive defensive uh, responses with areas responses associated with passive defensive strategies, such as the temporal junction that's really involved in out of body experiences. And so we had three groups. We had a healthy group, an N of 40, a PTSD group, at, uh, N of 60, and a subtype group, N of 37 back then. They've grown since then. And they were age uh, and gender matched. And we did a resting sleep paradigm again using our three Tesla. And then we divided uh, the PAG into a ventrolateral and dorsolateral region based on the atlas by the and this is what we found. So we found that both patient groups, both the post-traumatic stress and the subtype, all connected the PAG to the fusiform gyrus, even though the dissociative subtype showed greater connectivity to the fusiform gyrus. We all know that the fusiform gyrus is important in face recognition, and Porges has written uh, quite a bit about it, and also suggests it's uh, a sort of a safety monitoring area of the brain. So to check out, is the, you know, is the environment safe or trustworthy? Again, sort of a hypervigilance, a monitoring of the environment. So all people with post-traumatic stress and with the subtype show connectivity between the periapidotic brain and the fusiform gyrus. Now if we look at dorsolateral periapidotic brain connectivity, which is involved in active defensive responses, the post-traumatic stress disorder group uh, connects to the anterior insula, the left supplemental motor area, and the post-central gyrus, and the associated subtype group shows increased connectivity to the pre-central gyrus. And so all these areas are involved in active defensive response, which we hypothesize would be driven by the dorsolateral part of the period. And what we see when we look at the ventral lateral periapidoptal brain, an area involved in passive defensive responding, no, there's no increased connectivity in the post-traumatic stress disorder group without the subtype, which we would expect because they don't engage in passive defensive responding. But the subtype shows greater ventral lateral PAG connectivity with the left temporocrital junction as well as the right thalamic operculum, both areas uh, that seem to be involved in other body experiences. So my hypothesis is that the PAG, you know, that really mediates raw affect, may be driving these other body responses. So these were some uh, 
connectivity studies, and the next thing we wanted to do is really look at uh, the directionality of connectivity, especially keeping in mind uh, the Mobs' model as fear moves close that the periodic brain becomes much more important as compared to prefrontal structures. So again, as the fearful stimulus moves close, brain activation seems to shift from prefrontal structures to uh, the reptilian brain, including the periodic brain. And several years ago, our group came up with a model of how, what may be going on in people with post-traumatic stress that have mainly active defensive responses and hypo-emotionality compared to the dissociative subtype that has predominantly passive defensive responses and have that detached emotional presentation. And this model centered around the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, we hadn't included the perioperative brain in the model at the time. And so what the model hypothesized, and this has been substantiated with data from a number of groups now, that in people who have active defensive responses and hyper-emotionality, we see decreased amygdala prefrontal cortex activation, which then doesn't inhibit the amygdala enough and leads to hyperactivation of the amygdala. Whereas in the detached group, the emotion detached group, it's the opposite. We actually have increased prefrontal activation, which seems to over-inhibit the limbic system. And if we were to redo this model now, we would add the periaqueductal brain as well. And so we would have, you know, over suppression of the periaqueductal brain the subtype and uh, activation of the periaqueductal brain. And so this is why we wanted to do dynamic causal modeling and really look at the directionality of connectivity to uh, see the relationship between the ventromedial prefrontal cortex the amygdala, both the VLA and the CMA, as well as the periaqueductal brain. And so in the post-traumatic stress group, with active defensive responses and too much emotion, we uh, hypothesized that bottom-up PAG to amygdala and PAG to ventromedial prefrontal connectivity in PTSD, similar to Moms' model, when threat is imminent, those lower brain structures take over and really regulate the brain from bottom up. Whereas in the dissociative subtype, where you get that suppression of emotion, that emotional detachment, we hypothesize top-down prefrontal to amygdala and prefrontal to periaqueductal brain connectivity in that group. Here again, now we had a PTSD group now 62, subtype group now 41, and each match controls now 52. And uh, what we saw was that, indeed, in PTSD, we've got top-down regulation of the left BLA and right BLA, and bottom-up regulation from the periaqueductal brain to the left CMA and the right CMA. So when threat is near and when you have that hyper-emotionality, the PAG seems to be driving the, the CMA nuclei of the amygdala from a bottom-up way. And this was directly uh, opposite to what we saw in the dissociative subtype, where now we're seeing the CMA of the amygdala regulating the periaqueductal brain from top down. Again, we hypothesized that that would lead to uh, decreased emotionality and raw. Whereas uh, periaqueductal brain to bedroom media prefrontal cortex and post traumatic stress, again, you get this bottom-up driving of the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, just like in Moss's model, when fear is near, the periaqueductal brain takes over and influences the rest of the brain. Whereas in the associated subtype, we see the ventromedial prefrontal cortex uh, taking a top-down regulation of the periaqueductal brain, likely associated with hypomotionality. So just to summarize the directionality of connectivity, it's exactly opposite in the PTSD and subtype group, and it was similar to our early, earlier model, and it seems to reflect the clinical picture of hyper-emotionality and active defensive responses as compared to hypo-emotionality and passive defensive responses. This top-down over-modulation when you have emotional attachment and passive defensive responses. 
So how does the innate alarm system, these deep reptilian brain areas, uh, how are they related to social cognition, which of course is also very important in post-traumatic stress and often very effective in post-traumatic stress? And you see that this is a theory of mind, uh, moral reasoning, among others. And of course, when we think about social cognition, that takes us back to the attachment system, which is really the foundation of emotional development. And it's so striking that this is taught so little both in psychology and psychiatry, but the attachment system is really absolutely key to emotional development and the development of social cognition. And of course, the essence of social bonds is really eye contact. And of course, there's a cultural component here, but when we think about eye contact, this first occurs, of course, between infant and caregiver, right? And when we talk to our traumatized patients, often they'll tell us it's very difficult for them to look in the eyes of their infant, and we'll find out uh, why that is in a second. But what do we know about the neural circuitry of eye contact? And when we first looked into this, I was surprised how much there actually is in healthy individuals, how much that circuitry has been mapped out. And so in healthy individuals, when uh, one makes eye contact, again, you first get activation of the immune alarm system, including the superior curricula, superior aqueductal brain, and then very quickly these areas then recruit higher areas of social cognition. So dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, temporal pole, temporal parietal junction, amygdala, and those higher areas of social cognition help us to be able to reflect on the relationship we're in, and help us to get in touch with the intentions and feelings of others, and of course ourselves. And we have to be in touch with our own feelings in order to be able to be in touch with other people's intentions and feelings. So why study eye contact with post-traumatic stress? And clinically, I realized you know, very early on that my patients have tremendous difficulty making eye contact. And then several years later, when I was writing a book with my colleague Paul Fruin, I interviewed a Vietnam veteran. And uh, we started asking people as part of a qualitative interview, what's it like for you to make eye contact? And what Tim, we'll call him Tim for today, told me was, I cannot look anyone in the eye for fear that they will see the stain on my soul for what I have done in Vietnam. And I thought, bingo, this is exactly what it is. And so people with post-traumatic stress, whether they have been sexually abused and feel they're like terrible human beings as a result, or whether they've been involved in war trauma and they have moral injury, they're torn apart inside about what they have done or what they haven't done, cannot look people in the eye because they're afraid people will see what a horrible individual they are. And so we wanted to study this. Again, these are early stage studies. We want, really wanted to see what happens in the brains of people with post-traumatic stress when they make eye contact. And obviously, that's not an easy thing to study. But uh, we were looking in the literature, and I came across uh, this paper by Schrommel from Germany. And they studied psychophysiological responses to eye contact in healthy individuals. And they had developed these avatars either approaching you with direct eye contact versus avert eye contact in different emotional conditions. And so we approached them and we said, you know, can we use your paradigm? And they said, yes. And so I'll just uh, show this to you for a second. So this is a guy lying in the scanner and this guy looks at you with a direct gaze. So people were having been traumatized. When they saw the direct 
uh, versus the Burbank case, you can see areas of higher social cognition activating, right? So dorsal medial prefrontal cortex activated, temporal parietal uh, junction activated. So areas that are involved in theory of mind mentalizing, right? So they can mind the scanner, the avatar approaches, and they can think, well, what a stupid experiment this is. This is, this is an avatar, and he's not even real, right? He's not going to hurt me, right? They can mentalize that. They have those regions involved in theory of mind. Now, if you look on the right, you'll see people with post-traumatic stress. And what do they activate? All they activate are the superior colliculus, periaqueductal gray, and locus ceruleus. So areas involved in defensive responding. They do not activate any higher areas involved in social cognition. And so when they're lying in the scanner and the avatar approaches, they can't mentalize. They can't reflect on the situation, but rather immediately they're drawn into a defensive response, almost a lower state of consciousness that prevents them from reflecting on the situation. And of course, this would lead to decreased social affiliation right, and withdrawal. And so what do we need to think about you know, as we look at those preliminary results? I think we need to think about uh, how can we bring this system online in treatment. But I think we also need to think about, we know that social support is the most important predictor post-trauma. But if somebody has that kind of response to direct eye contact, can they utilize social support post-trauma? And how can we alleviate their difficulty using social support? And I think. It also begs some very important questions around the intergenerational transmission of trauma. So if you have that response to direct eye contact, when you make direct eye contact with your child, do you have that same response? And so that your areas of higher social cognition and theory of mind don't come online, which are critical for emotional development of the child, and is this one mechanism that facilitates the intergenerational transmission of trauma. And it's something we really want to study, and certainly when we talk to PTSD patients, they'll tell you, often I cannot look my child in the eyes, because again, they're afraid that the child will know what a horrible person they are. So I think it's a really critical study that needs to be done. So what are implications for treatment if you know these low brain structures are you know, driving a lot of the symptoms that we see, what do we need to think about? And so I think in terms of pharmacological treatments, when we think back to that stress response curve, where fight and flight analgesic responses were being mediated by the endocannabinoids versus uh, the uh, passive defensive responding was really mediated by opioid blockade, both at the mu and kappa level, we really need to think about how we can employ you know, pharmacological agents that target directly some of these uh, receptors. And certainly I use uh, opioid blockade for dissociative symptoms often, and sometimes at very low doses. And I see that it, that can really bring people back into the present, but also decrease the dysphoric symptoms that is likely mediated by the kappa opioid symptom, uh, system. But I think we also need to think about implications for psychotherapeutic interventions, right? And I think one of the primary goals of psychotherapy is emotion regulation, right? And so to think about how do we regulate emotions. And I think there's two ways, as we all know about. There's a bottom-up way, as we've seen throughout this talk, right? So these deep brain structures involved in raw affective responses really influencing the limbic and cortical systems, which of course then also re-regulate the, the lower parts of the brain if the connectivity is appropriate. But often we exclusively think about top-down regulation, right? And most of our psychotherapies are really designed to target top-down regulation. And so cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, deals, deals directly with top-down regulation. And it's often very effective. But what I often find is that our patients come back, especially patients that I think have very disruptive brain connectivity, 
And they say to me, I know this wasn't my fault, Ruth, but I don't feel it. I cannot feel that it wasn't my fault. I continue to feel that it is my fault. And I think when people come back and tell you that, you know, we've reorganized the cortex at some level, but we haven't reached those lower brainstem areas that are driving these raw affective responses. And so how can we target directly those lower brain areas? And I think there's various body psychotherapies that work from a bottom-up uh, approach. But uh, one thing we've been uh, experimenting with is alpha neurofeedback. And we're hypothesizing that that's a treatment, an adjunct of treatment, that may aid both in bottom-up and top-down regulation. And I want to explain to you why I say that. How many of you are familiar with neurofeedback? Yeah, so it's basically a form of biofeedback, but to here you're using your brain waves, and you set the computer to, say, change alpha waves, and whenever you do that, you get feedback in the form of a computer game, for example, Pac-Man eating dots, or a space rocket moving forward. And so it gives you direct feedback on how you manipulate your mental state in order to achieve whatever you want to achieve. And you may think this is very difficult, but actually in Utrecht years ago they did a study where they trained monkeys to alter their brain waves. So every time the monkey was able to alter its brain waves, it got a peanut and very quickly was able to do that. And humans too, it's, it's very quick that people can figure out how to alter their brain waves. And especially if you've suffered a lot of trauma, that also gives you a feeling of increased control, which you've often never had when you're experiencing a lot of trauma. And so we did alpha neurofeedback. And to start out with, we just did a mechanistic study. The cash was involved in this as well, where we wanted to see uh, you know, what mechanism may be involved with alpha neurofeedback. And can we reach these deep brainstem areas? And so what we did was we did a resting state scan. We did a 30-minute alpha neurofeedback session and another resting state. This, uh, was first time with Thomas Ross and also wrote the conclusionary lab. And so what we found was that uh, before the neurofeedback, the rest of it, we looked at amygdala connectivity, and we found before the neurofeedback session, we actually had increased connectivity between the amygdala and the periaqueductal brain, right? So that area, that deep brain area driving these defensive responses and these raw affect. And then what happened after the one session of neurofeedback, after which people also reported increased calmness, what we saw was that now the amygdala connected more to prefrontal regions involved in top-down emotion regulation. And so we saw that we were able to shift this pattern of connectivity with this form of neurofeedback to be before neurofeedback to have increased connectivity between amygdala and periaqueductal brain, and that shifts to amygdala prefrontal regions, and of course the prefrontal cortex can regulate limbic and periaqueductal brain regions. And this also correlated with the alpha waves as well as changes in calmness. We've now just completed an RCT and the preliminary uh, findings after 20 sessions of alpha neurofeedback actually replicate this finding. So it's just, you know, I think really increasing our thinking on what brain areas are involved and what specific targets and therapies do we need to use in order to target these different brain areas. And again, I think that brings us more towards uh, personalized medicine you know, what works for who, when. And so when somebody comes back and says, I know it's not my fault, but I can't stop feeling it, we still have work to do. And uh, I'm hypothesize that that means that we really need to target more directly these deeper brain structures. Where do we go from here? A lot of work is to be done. You know, the brain stem is a, is a very complex place. That's hard to image, but uh, you know the techniques are becoming more sophisticated. And I think we really need to consider incorporating the brainstem 
happen to current models of post-traumatic stress and stress in general. I think it's also critical to the mind-body connection. It's critical to sleep and pain, everything that's so affected by stress. And so I really think we need to think about these models uh, much more uh, carefully. Of course, Gerald Nordhoff, who's in the United State, is you know, one of the people in the field who really thinks about the brainstem also uh, in relation to the sense itself, which uh, we're really starting to think about as well. So I think it's really important, and Ottawa certainly uh, the I think we also need to utilize uh, high uh, field strength, some of the tests that we're starting to do that in London now. <coughs> And we need to continue to enhance very interesting that and test these techniques to allow us to get the most of the brainstem. And now we have suit available, for example, that I think is really helpful. And I think we continue to have to continue to think about supra and subliminal exposure, right? Subliminal exposure, I think, is just as important as superliminal. And I think we really have to keep them on hold. Again, I think we need to think about periodic the grades, role in pain and sleep, critical to stress and trauma, and really think about the implications of novel pharmacotherapeutic agents to target directly those deep, deep brain areas. And then, of course, also think about implications for early intervention. Now, to end, I just want to end with a note of hope and share a quote from you of one of the patients who did the neurofeedback study. And he said, it's like someone has gone into my brain and put the things back together. It's like someone has made some connections. By the end of it, I felt more in control. I don't feel as out of it. I feel more together. Thank you.
have high alpha. And so what we saw in people who had low alpha and we decreased the alpha, we saw a homeostatic rebound. So their alpha actually increased over time. And in people who had high alpha, the alpha actually kept coming down over time. So I'm just thinking of psychosis and some of our folks, and we were thinking of doing some neurofeedback because of that, you know, head heart connection piece you're mm -hmm. talking about overall is the high association with trauma. Yeah. Um, and that sounds really important as far as the neurofeedback and then being able to make some of those, like doing neurofeedback and then the CBT work. Yeah. You are so feedback. And there is a study that's showing that when you come back and decrease voices, it's just fine. It's That's very exciting. Um, yeah, I think it's a nice adjunct to yeah. 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 And do you think yoga and things like that, um, you know, if, if you think about feeling more in control within your body and having a Absolutely, as long as it's not in a chronic form. Right? Yes. It's a bottom-up way of work, right? Right.
the really I'll send you the paper as soon as it's decided. Okay, good yeah. <laughs> okay. But I'd love to talk to you further and also talk more about our collaboration. Yeah. I have a question about EMDR. Yeah. Is it supposed to, like, is it, how does that work exactly? Does That's it, a great does question. Does that work, like, through these, um, like, some preparations for polyglots? Is that... I would hypothesize, and we just collect some data actually looking at mechanistically eye movements uh, during traumatic memory recall and during neutral recall, and we're just starting to analyze uh, what effect we have on the superior colliculus system as a seed. Um, we looked at the frontal eye fields and the supplemental eye fields uh, you know, in the cortex, how they are affected by these eye movements, and eye movements bring online actually uh, the frontal parietal network um, that's both linked to the default mode network and the dorsal attention network. So eye movements during trauma we call bring online that frontal parietal network, which may facilitate top-down regulation, right, which may also bring online sense of time, which is often lacking in traumatic memory recall. So I think it's very sophisticated. Uh, some other studies have found that uh, there's also alterations in the amygdala, we didn't find that. But yes, certainly eye movements directly uh, work on the frontal and supplemental eye fields, which then bring online all these cortical networks. And now we want to look at what happens yeah, further down. So but you think it starts up the top of it? No, I think no. You know, it's, I think it, it's both, I think, but the quicker route is, is probably supportive. And so it probably involves orienting response through the superior curriculum. It's a very interesting question, especially because you know so many people are in front of the MDR. And then when you actually go into the literature and you look at eye movements, just a moment, it makes complete sense. Are you guys looking at brain spotting? No, not yet, but uh, I work with that clinically sometimes. And mm -hmm. somebody yeah, that for, really wants to do that. Oh, okay. Like it's asking us to like, I think it's fascinating when you bring up an emotion and then you shift your eyes, how that emotion can lessen or increase through changes in eye movement. A lot of things we don't know, but again, we have to keep open mind, right? because certainly experientially that's what we experience. Brain is a complex place. <laughs> From your experience, though, do you notice that people who have PTSD before they had child are more likely to experience that uh, lack of connection, whereas if they develop PTSD after they've already bonded with the child, that would make a difference? Yeah, so this, this is most extreme with people with severe childhood trauma. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Other questions? 